joining us today in this wonderful Sofia evening. Uh, my name is Petko Zelazov and this is Razi Online. We are generously supported by the European Space Agency to carry out this uh, event uh, together with the National, National Culture Fund and the company Melon. And last but not least, of course, we want to thank the people who are uh, supporting us uh, through Patreon. Your contributions are invaluable. This is why uh, the lights are basically on uh, today. <coughs> So, uh, for today we have a very, very interesting uh, event. We will be talking about exoplanets. And, guys, I mean, bear in mind, it was only 25 years ago that the first exoplanet was actually detected. I mean, the discovery was recently recognized with the Nobel Prize. And now we know about more than 4,500 exoplanets, and their study uh, has sort of become one of the most dynamic and you know, fascinating research fields in astronomy. Uh, with the help of you know, very sophisticated instruments like Space Telescope, we are now able to track new missions holding promise for very, very exciting findings. Uh, and in this talk, we will actually provide insight into the design and development specifically of the KEOPS mission, which is the first mission of the European Space Agency dedicated to the characterization of known exoplanets, uh, which is already in orbit. Uh, since its launch in December 2019, KEOPS has already made some remarkable discoveries, uh, like the fifth planet of the TOI-178 system and the characterization of WASP-189b, uh, one of the hottest exoplanets known to date. In parallel, uh, we have other exoplanet observations uh, that continue providing you know, very exciting new results, such as the recent discovery of GLEES uh, 486b, which is a super-Earth orbiting a nearby red dwarf star. Now, in spite of the great advances in exoplanet science of the last decades, there are still fundamental open questions about the nature of exoplanets and on whether there are other planetary systems like our own. The European Space Agency Exoplanet Program aims at you know, shedding light on these key issues, and in particular, the PLATO mission with a planned launch in 2026 that will focus on the discovery of ter uh, terrestrial planets orbiting up to the habitable zone of solar-like stars. Um, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, of which many of you have already heard, we had like multiple shows about it, uh, it will be launched this year. Uh, and, of course, uh, Ariel, with a launch date in 2029 uh, that will unveil the atmospheric chemical compositions of a large number of exoplanets. So today, a conversation around exoplanets, uh, what is happening with these missions, what are some of the specifics that we need to, uh, that we need to know and pay attention to. We will be speaking with uh, two very prominent scientists and engineers from the European Space Agency uh, that will you know, give us some clarity on the topics that I just discussed ahead. Uh, so we're going to have um, uh, a discussion uh, with both of them. Uh, first, uh, we will uh, have you know, short presentations by both of them uh, that will focus primarily on their specific field. And later on, we will uh, discuss any questions that you guys might have uh, for, uh, for both of them in, in the discussion panel. Uh, just to remind you, uh, of course, we are, uh, you, can, you can use the, sl the Slido program, sli.do, uh, with uh, code Exoplanets, was it? Technical team? Thank you, guys. Yes, so uh, with this code, submit your questions, and I will do my best to pass them on to Anna and Carlos. Now, uh, we're going to start off with uh, Carlos Corral van Dam, uh, who, uh, you know, just as, as a short bio, he studied aeronautical en uh, engineering at the Polytechnic University of Madrid. He completed his master's thesis at the Supaero in Toulouse. And in 2012, he was appointed as a principal system engineer in the KEOPS mission uh, when the project was still actually at the very conceptual design phase. Uh, in that role, he has been involved in the complete development of KEOPS uh, until its successful launch in 2019 and further in orbit commissioning. Um, now, Carlos is currently part of the core ESA team um, for, uh, for, for the mission, so, um, you know, He's a, very, he's a very interesting and knowledgeable guy, and uh, he will be shedding light on some of the aspects or the main aspects of uh, our search for exoplanets. Carlos, are you with us? Oh, you're welcome, sir. I, I, I said so many words that my mouth currently hurts, so I'm, I'm going to pass on the torch uh, to you in a few minutes. I hope you're feeling well today. All right, very good. I heard, I heard the weather in the Netherlands sucks right now, so it's um, you know it's 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 nice that you that you are in house right now. So, all right. So, uh, Carlos, whenever you are ready, uh, you can you can go ahead and start. Okay, thanks a lot, and um, yeah, good evening to to everyone. Um, <coughs> Indeed, the weather is not uh, very good in the Netherlands, but uh, I heard that it's a uh, beautiful. 
It's uh, truly a pleasure for, for me to be here and, and to talk about uh, about chaos and, and, and about exoplanets. And, and this is what we are discussing today, exoplanets. So an exoplanet is, is a planet orbiting a star uh, which is not our sun. Mm -hmm. so Uh, it all started, uh, as Petko was saying in the, in the introduction, only uh, some 25 years ago. Uh, this was uh, 1995, when uh, the first exoplanet was discovered around a star similar to the Sun. So for a long time, the astronomers uh, had thought that there could be planets also orbiting the other stars, uh, such as the planets uh, that we know orbit the Sun. However, it was not until that day uh, when the first planet was, was discovered. Uh, and it was uh, also a surprising discovery because uh, that first exoplanet was uh, much bigger and it was orbiting much closer to uh, its uh, host star than what the astronomers uh, thought at that time that it was possible. This discovery was uh, by two Swiss uh, astronomers, uh, Michael Mayor and Didier Kelor. And in fact, uh, it won them the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics that they received in 2019. And uh, from that moment on, uh, we have uh, continued uh, discovering more and more exoplanets uh, in a sort of exponential curve. So quite slowly at the beginning, but uh, recently at a much faster rate. So you see there the number of exoplanets that have been discovered per year through different methods, yeah, because in fact we can uh, we cannot observe them directly, and and we use indirect methods uh, to find these exoplanets and to confirm them. Some of these methods we will be explaining uh, later today, uh, and as you see, many of them have been uh, discovered through the transit method, which is a key uh, method for the mission we will be talking about today, about chaos. Most of these discoveries have been done through space observatories. It is also true that, of course, ground observatories have contributed to these discoveries, but these surely space missions that have been key to this exponential growth in the number of uh, planets detected. And you see here two fundamental missions, uh, missions that have already flown and actually uh, whose uh, mission has already ended. Uh, Corot on the left, this is a French European satellite that was truly a pioneer in the field of uh, looking for uh, exoplanets uh, through the transit method. And on the right, a very famous exoplanet hunter the NASA mission Kepler, that uh, alone has discovered more exoplanets than or any other space mission or ground observatory. And this is actually the transit method that uh, both missions use uh, to detect exoplanets. It's quite intuitive, uh, so easy to understand. What we do is look at a star and we try to measure how much light are we receiving from that star? Actually, what we measure is how bright the star is. So what happens is that uh, when a planet passes in front of the star as seen from the Earth, this planet will block part of the light that was coming to us. And this is mini eclipse, which is causing a reduction in the amount of light that we receive, a, a drop in the brightness of the star that lasts for a certain time, 
for how long as the planet transits in front of the star. And this is actually what we measure, this drop in the amount of light. This is a tiny effect. Uh, so for instance, if Jupiter passes in front of our sun, the reduction in the brightness of the sun is about 1%. But of course, Jupiter is a very big planet. If we talk about a planet like the Earth, then this effect is 100 times uh, smaller. So we need a lot of precision to be able to measure these transits. So we have discussed briefly about exoplanets, about uh, previous missions, and about the transit method. But we are mainly talking uh, this evening about CHAOPS. CHAOPS is uh, actually the first ESA mission fully dedicated to the study of exoplanets. It's also the first ESA small class mission. And by small class mission, we refer to a satellite, which is typically more compact in size, that was comparatively cheaper than other space missions, and whose development time has also been uh, short. And is of course a mission very relevant for me because as Petko was saying, I work uh, from the very beginning on, uh, on this mission uh, from 2012 uh, through, throughout all the phases in the project uh, up until the satellite was uh, manufactured, tested and launched and also operated in orbit. So what is the science objective of chaos? What we are trying to achieve uh, the idea here was not so much to discover a new exoplanet, but rather to be able to measure very precisely the sizes of exoplanets that were already known. And uh, this precision in the measurement of the size is linked to the precision in this transit method that we have discussed before. And it's very relevant because if we can know the radius, the size of a planet, very precisely. And if we know its mass by other methods, we can derive its density. And the density, knowing the density, is the first step in the characterization of an exoplanet, in knowing whether it would be a gas giant as Jupiter, an ice giant as Neptune, a terrestrial planet like the Earth, or something completely different. This is the objective of chaos. And, and this, of course, uh, is a challenging objective, because in order to measure very precisely those sizes of the exoplanets, we need to also be very precise in what we call the photometry, in measuring this amount of light that comes from a star. As you see, we are trying to measure an effect which is in the order of tens to 100 parts per million. So we need to be very precise. And in order to achieve that precision, in terms of in engineering terms, we need to be very stable. Very stable, for instance, with the pointing of the spacecraft and of the telescope. So when we look at a star, we want to ensure that we are always illuminating the same pixels in the detector. Because we know that the pixels in a detector behave differently and have a different response. And if the pointing is not stable, we will be illuminating different pixels. And as a result, they, they can introduce a certain noise in the signal. We also need to be very stable thermally. That is the temperature of the detector needs to be kept with variations of few millikelvin of uh, temperature. Because if those variations were higher, the different response of the detector will also cause noise in the measurements. Electronics needs also to be designed to be as stable as possible. And the other challenge uh, of CHAOPS was uh, to try to be able to point our spacecraft almost anywhere in the sky. Because since we want to characterize uh, planets which are already known, we also need to be able to observe almost any star in the sky. And that means from an engineering point of view that we had to think about a lot about what, uh, which was the best orbit for chaos and uh, what was its best attitude, that is the orientation of the satellite on space to be able 
essentially to point anywhere in the sky and at the same time keep the photometric precision that we were discussing in the slide before. So we're going to look in how uh, now the, the, mm, the spacecraft uh, look like, and in particular, the most important equipment on board, which is here what we call the payload, that is the instrument, the telescope. That is the telescope that we will use to do this photometry and be able to uh, characterize exoplanets via the transit method. Uh, it is an amazing design, this telescope, all uh, with the idea to achieve this stability. For instance, it had uh, some dedicated radiators to keep the detector at a temperature of minus 40 degrees and also to keep that, temper that temperature extremely stable. You can also see a long tube uh, which is covered in black MLI. This long tube uh, is a buffer to protect in the telescope from stray light, which is uh, light not coming directly from the star that we are imaging, but potentially uh, light which is reflected, uh, for instance, uh, by the Earth, so sunlight which is reflected by the Earth atmosphere, and that may contaminate our measurements. So the telescope of Cheops, uh, its main uh, equipment, and is mounted on a very capable spacecraft that you see there uh, on the right, you would see, you would recognize the telescope mounted on top of a, a, a hexagonal shape. It is a very compact spacecraft, uh, less than uh, 300 kilograms. It is compact because Chaos is a small mission and it had to fit within the launcher fading. It is also uh, compact uh, in shape so that we can essentially point anywhere in the sky. And you would see there that uh, the back and also the sides are covered uh, by solar arrays to get energy. And in fact, is a design which is characterized by uh, the quest for high stability for the observations. This is the Chaos uh, orbit. Uh, that was a very nice <laughs> engineering challenge to try to find the best orbit for Chaos within the constraints that we had. Chaos is orbiting at 700 kilometers above from the Earth, and it is in a so-called sun-synchronous dawn-dusk orbit. So I will try to explain what this term uh, means. Uh, what it means is that Chaos is flying always over uh, the so-called terminator. The terminator is the region that separates the day and the night uh, on, on Earth. So that Chaos is always flying either over the part of the world where the sun is rising or on the, the other side of the orbit uh, over in the part of the world where the uh, sun is setting. And uh, why did we choose that orbit for Chaos? Because this orbit provides a very stable thermal environment so very good for the stability of the temperatures, because we can get a lot of power for our solar arrays and get uh, you know, sufficient uh, power to run uh, the instruments and all the equipment. And also because the stray light that we discussed before uh, was best because we are always looking towards the night side, towards the dark side of the sky. So Chaos, like uh, other uh, ESA missions is truly a European effort. So we have discussed some of the technical challenges that we have to face, but there are also the difficulties associated with uh, a project which is run through multiple countries and multiple companies, universities and institutions all over Europe. So even if the uh, payload, the instrument of uh, Chaos was mainly developed in Switzerland, and the satellite itself was mainly developed in Spain. You can see there in the graph that uh, there were many countries that participated into this uh, mission. So even if it was a small class mission, it was a truly European effort with many parties involved. This of course, at the same time challenging, but also very enriching uh, as a work environment because you get to interact with people from all over Europe. 
And this plot here represents a timeline of the project that I said before we started in 2012, uh, when chaos was just a concept, uh, essentially some drawings and, and, and some short paragraphs describing uh, what the mission could do. And it took us seven years to have the uh, spacecraft launch in orbit and ready for the operation. These seven years were very intense, I can assure you. There were many uh, milestones we had to pass, many reviews where the whole design is subject to the review of the ESA experts. Uh, and, um, I, and then finally, we, we were able to uh, indeed get the, the spacecraft in orbit after these seven years, which may appear as a very long time. And you know, within a lifetime, it is a long time. But compared to uh, other science missions, is actually very fast <laughs> because other space missions take uh, even much longer in the making. So once the spacecraft uh, and the instruments uh, are designed and, and, and when they are uh, manufactured, then there uh, starts a very intense uh, campaign of testing because this is the difficulty of space, uh, you launch a spacecraft and then you cannot uh, fix it, uh, you cannot go there and fix it if, if something is, is wrong. Uh, so you don't have access to it anymore, that's why it's so important to test beforehand. And, and we do multiple tests. The one that uh, you saw here, in the, you see here in the, in the photograph, is uh, actually done at Estec in the Netherlands, in the anechoic uh, chamber. And we were testing there the radio frequency performance. So essentially how good we could communicate with the spacecraft through its antennas. But there are also many other tests, uh, mechanical, so we vibrate. We, we want to be sure that the structure will sustain the loads of the launch, for instance. There are thermal tests where we check the, the temperatures that the different equipment will, will achieve. Of course, many functional tests also a very intense campaign uh, going through different test centers in Europe. And then when we were done, it was uh, the moment to prepare for launch. Uh, as you can imagine, a very exciting moment for the team after so many years of working on the mission. Uh, you can see me there in the, in the picture uh, at the right of this uh, group of people uh, cheering uh, just uh, by the satellite. Uh, my arm there appears extremely long, but I can assure you that my arm is not that long. It's just the lens that was used to take the picture. Uh, the satellite is by us. Uh, you can see uh, its, its size. Uh, it's covered in, in plastic, uh, in a plastic bag, and we were also purging it with nitrogen to keep it uh, as clean as possible before launch. And in the picture in the right, you can see uh, when these bags are already removed, just a few days before the launch, and then we uh, were integrating uh, the satellite within the fading of the rocket of the launcher. Very special moment. Uh, the launch was um, planned for 17th of December, uh, all was ready then. But a few, uh, you know, just before the countdown, a problem uh, was detected with the rocket. Uh, and the launch had to be aborted and postponed by one day. <laughs> you can imagine for our nerves <laughs> what that meant. But the next day, uh, the 18th of December, uh, all went smoothly. And you see that picture from uh, the moment uh, the Soyuz uh, rocket was launching from uh, French Guiana, from Kourou. It was uh, 6 a.m. Uh, local time, and uh, Keops was in, inside that fading together with other spacecraft because this was a shared launch. So sometimes this is done uh, in order to save uh, some cost for the project because the cost of the rocket is shared among uh, several satellites. And, and of course, this was possible because we were going into a similar orbit uh, than the other satellites. And uh, yeah, it was a beautiful launch, uh, very beautiful images, but it was uh, not over then. Uh, it was mainly the, only the beginning of the operations. Uh, this is a picture I took from the uh, 
Mission Operations Center in, in Madrid, uh, where the Keok satellite is being operated. And this is, I think, a picture of the 31st day. So at the beginning, we had to be there uh, day and night, so almost 24 hours uh, present on the console in order to uh, perform uh, the initial operations for the satellite, which are um, critical in, in many cases. So of course, receiving the first signal from the spacecraft, sending the first command, the first instructions, uh, seeing that the spacecraft is able to uh, to understand those commands and, and, and do all the actions that are planned, like acquiring the first orbit, uh, checking all the equipment, etc. So it's, it's a process that takes uh, almost a week. And then uh, after that, we started, uh, as an example, you know, the operations of uh, more related to the instrument. Uh, and this is an example of one of the critical operations that we had to do then which is the opening of the cover. Uh, you may have seen in the previous slides that um, the Keops tele telescope uh, was protected by, by a cover, uh, which you can see there in this uh, cover in this gold foil. And this was used to uh, protect the optics of the telescope from uh, contamination, from any particles, any dust that could uh, affect to the optics. So uh, the cover was designed to be uh, closed during launch and also during the early operations and to be open only once in orbit and forever. So this is a mechanism that op is operated only once. So from closed all the time up to the moment where the uh, cover is open and then it will remain open for the rest of the mission. So this is what the engineers, uh, the, what we call a single point failure, uh, because as you can imagine, if uh, the cover uh, fails to open, then there are no images whatsoever. There is no science and no mission for chaos. Uh, and of course, we had taken all the measurements we could take in order to be sure that the design was reliable and that we have tested the opening of this cover multiple times uh, on ground, but still uh, we were quite nervous <laughs> by the time uh, we had to send the command to, to open the cover. And, and this we did, and, and luckily um, it all went uh, good, and we received the telemetry indicating that the, that the cover was open according to plan. And then we received uh, the first light <laughs> of chaos. Of course, it's uh, also an exciting moment for every uh, telescope, uh, but also for, uh, for ours. Uh, uh, this is uh, what you see now in your screens is, is this first light of, of chaos, uh, the first image that we took. It may strike you because uh, it appears to be blurred. Uh, so out of focus, uh, but this is done on purpose uh, and it's also related to the stability in the photometry. So if we want to measure this amount of light that comes from a star as accurately as possible, it turns out that it's good to have the image of that star uh, out of focus so that it covers a number of pixels in the detector rather than just one. And this is what we what you can see there, uh, the, the circle uh, zooms over the target star. Uh, you can also see all the stars in the field of view. But that one uh, is out of focus, uh, as I was saying, on purpose. And, and we were very glad to get this picture and see that the performance of, of Chaos in orbit was even better than what we had um, designed for and that what we expected. So we continued uh, doing other operations with, uh, with the instrument, checking the performance for different uh, attitude, uh, different sort of observations, also checking, of course, all the rest of the equipment. And a few months after launch, uh, we essentially were ready. Uh, instrument fully commissioned, a spacecraft uh, doing great. So ready for the science. And uh, yeah, this is what uh, Anna is going to talk about in the in the next presentation, the first uh, scientific results 
that come from from this uh, small but uh, great nation chaos. Uh, now uh, we uh, we will be expecting the questions from from our uh, our audience uh, coming in. I uh, hope you guys listen listened carefully. Uh, but now we're going to continue uh, with Anna Carlos. Uh, as you said, um, Anna will be giving us some insight on uh, the first scientific results actually achieved by the Keops mission, uh, and you know some more information about exoplanets in general. Uh, as a short introduction, uh, Anna Keros uh, is a project scientist of the Plato mission and leads the astrophysics observatory section in the European Space Agency. Uh, she has worked as a scientist in a number of ESA missions. Uh, she was a member of the Science Operations Center for the Infrared Space Observatory, uh, and she's been a deputy project scientist uh, of the Herschel Space Observatory. Uh, Anna, can you hear me and see me? Yes. I, I'm afraid we cannot hear you, though. Can you yeah, check? Hello, good evening. Yes. Hi. Hi. This is a, this is a common common issue that we're all facing. Sometimes the microphone is off, and sometimes it's on when it's not supposed to be, as a, <laughs> as, as some of our viewers know know very well from previous events. Uh, Anna, welcome welcome to the show. I mean, we are looking forward to uh, what uh, what you have to what you have to to present to us. So, I mean, whenever whenever you feel ready, you can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, here is uh, my presentation. I'm going to talk uh, about the science of Keops. Uh, you heard already how the mission was built. Uh, indeed, a fantastic mission uh, that is operating very well. And uh, well, in uh, this uh, year and, and a half that he's been in orbit, he has uh, really uh, uh, made fantastic discoveries, but I'm just going to talk about uh, two of them. And then of course we will see many more in the future. So first I'm going to talk about uh, WASP 189b. Uh, this is a, a Jupiter light planet that is of the size of 1.5 uh, Jupiter radii and uh, orbits a star that is uh, very massive and blue, and actually is a star that uh, is uh, so, uh, yeah, it's so big and it uh, rotates so fast that uh, is uh, uh, poles, uh, the distance of the, to the poles is uh, shorter than in the equator. So it means that uh, uh, the poles are brighter. So then this uh, creates a special effect that we call gravitational darkening. And then uh, when Keops look uh, at this exoplanet, then uh, if you look at the plot that is uh, here on the right uh, at the bottom, then this is the transit indeed. This is as Carlos explained. So when the exoplanet goes in front of the, of the star and uh, there it measured it with such a precision that it discovered that this exoplanet is 15% less, uh, uh, well, less big, smaller, and therefore less dense uh, than, than the exoplanet that people thought it was. So uh, this, uh, this uh, was a new discovery. And uh, then also the shape of the transit uh, was special because uh, indeed the exoplanet was orbiting the star, not exactly uh, parallel to the equator, but actually was uh, orbiting around the poles. And that's why we were seeing a different transit shape uh, because of the dark uh, gravitational darkening that we talked about before. In addition, uh, the exoplanet also uh, was uh, going around the, uh, the, the star and Keops is so, so precise that he could see how when the planet was occulted by the star, there was also a dip in the light. And then this dip is even much smaller than the transit, as you can see in the, in the panel that is uh, at, the, at the top. And uh, there, uh, with this information, with this observation, uh, you can derive uh, what the temperature of the exoplanet is, which in this case was 3,200 Kelvin, uh, which uh, is a very, well, very, very hot, is one of the hottest and most extreme walls that, uh, that we know. 
and uh, without uh, chaos, we wouldn't have got this information with this precision. Okay, the next uh, uh, one is I'm going to talk about the uh, TOI 178 system. This is a system that was discovered by TESS, uh, the TESS satellite that, uh, that Carlos has also talked about by NASA. And then uh, this uh, saw that could be yeah, maybe two exoplanets around uh, this star. But actually what Keops saw is that they were not only two, that there were six exoplanets. And uh, by measuring also very precisely the radius and the mass on the ground, they could see what the uh, density of these exoplanets was. And that Keops saw that actually the density is, uh, didn't have a correlation with the distance of the star like we see in other systems, but you could see a terrestrial planet close by to a mini Jupiter, close to a Neptune. And then this new architecture that we see in the system uh, give, will give us a lot of clues of how planetary systems are formed because this is indeed uh, a special one, something that we didn't expect. In addition, uh, this uh, peculiarity in the way that these planets move around the star. And then they actually uh, follow a rhythm, rhythmic dancing. I mean, they are really their orbits. They are synchronized in such a way that with uh, in uh, one of these planets uh, orbits three times, uh, then uh, the other one completes uh, the, their orbit in, in six in uh, six times, the other one in nine times, the other one in eighteen. The only one that is not synchronized is the planet that is closer uh, to the to the star. Then if we can uh, see uh, the video now, and uh, this is a, a very nice video that the people who made this discovery uh, had made. And there you can see how the planets, when they uh, go into the same phase of the orbit, actually, then you would hear a music. I mean, you would hear indeed a sound, like if the, yeah, uh, the rhythm that they are following. And then you can see it a little bit with the lights that it indeed, they uh, uh, go, some of them, exactly at the same time like now, when they are uh, really in resonance, they are really uh, going uh, with this, uh, in these periodic rhythmic movements, such that uh, we can feel a sort of harmony of, uh, of, the, uh, of the movement of planets around the star. Okay, then now I'm uh, going to continue with other discoveries. This is not a uh, Keops one, so then I'm going to talk about a very nice finding uh, of a Bulgarian astronomer, Trifon Trifonov, that uh, is uh, working at uh, MPIA in Germany. And then he's the leader of a team that uh, discovered Hlise uh, 486b. And then uh, this uh, exoplanet is very special and uh, the, well, it was also discovered by TES. They also made uh, radial velocities on the ground and they made this very beautiful video in which uh, we, we can go on a virtual trip uh, to the exoplanet. And then yeah, if we can start, uh, then uh, yeah, you can see indeed uh, that this uh, star is, uh, in the, uh, is in the Virgo uh, constellation. And then uh, it was observed in radial velocities, it was observed in transit as we see here. And then uh, be because of these uh, two measurements, we could measure the density of the exoplanet, which turned out to be really like a terrestrial planet. So we know that it has a similar composition to the Earth, but it's an exoplanet that is really close to the star. It's at a temperature of 400 degrees uh, Celsius. And, and therefore, uh, the idea is that it's full of lava. It's a planet, it's a lava planet full of volcanic activity. And uh, this, is, uh, this makes it very interesting also because it's a star that is very close to us. And uh, it's only 20 side, like, 26 light years away, uh, which uh, makes it much easier uh, to make a spectroscopic observations to derive, for example, the atmosphere composition in case that indeed uh, the exoplanet has an atmosphere. And we can also study in much more detail uh, how it forms and, uh, yeah, and derive other properties. Okay, so uh, uh, and now that we have seen these very beautiful discoveries, I wanted to talk a little bit more about different uh, methods. Uh, to measure the um, uh, yeah uh, to measure the light that comes from the star that uh, can tell us if there's an exoplanet or not so i will start with the radial velocity that we already mentioned several times in this talk and uh, what uh, uh, the method is based on is on the fact that when a star has a planet around uh, it 
that a star and the exoplanet or the planet move around the center of gravity of the system. And therefore, we look at the light of the star. We don't see the planet, but we see that the star is indeed uh, moving in this uh, wobble around. And uh, when we look in very high precision at the light of the star, then we see the different colors, the spectrum, how it moves to the red or to the blue, depending if the star is going farther or coming closer to us. And with this information, we can derive what is the mass, or lower limit of the mass of the planet that is perturbing the movement uh, or is uh, causing this movement of the star. That's why the radial velocity method is mainly done from the ground and is very important to determine the masses and actually needs a lot of photons because you need to have spectrum and then this requires much more light than when you, for example, do uh, a transit measurement. Okay, another uh, very important method to discover exoplanets is direct imaging. And then here you can see on the uh, left panel, uh, uh, this is actually a, a movie of a real observation, so it's not a simulation. And then here, uh, what uh, uh, the, the technique that has been used is coronography that consists in blocking the light of the star because the light of the star is much, much, much more intense than the uh, light of the exoplanets. And then by blocking the light of the star so we can see the exoplanets around. This is a young star, uh, HRA799. And uh, these observations were done by the Keck Observatory. And here you can see how the part that is dark is indeed the, one, the, the, the coronograph. And then this is around 20 uh, astronomical units, which is more or less the distance to Uranus. So you can have an idea of what is the distance of the exoplanets that uh, we see here. Actually, this is an accelerated movie that is goes much, much lower. And the uh, period of the exoplanet that is uh, closer to the, uh, to the star is uh, something like 40 uh, years. And the one that is farther away that uh, you may see here on the, on the left side. So this is around 400 years period. So then uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic view that we are going to see much more often thanks to the advances in instrumentation. Another method that is also uh, very important and is going to deliver very new results uh, very soon is microlensing. And microlensing is based on the fact that uh, uh, the light of a distant object can be perturbed by the presence of a planet uh, that is around the star in between that object and the Earth. And then this perturbation we can analyze uh, because it's indeed like a lens. It's, a, it's like we, we have a perturbation by a, lens, by a lens and we can determine uh, more or less what is the, the mass of this, of this planet. And uh, with this technique, we can see objects that are very far in the galaxy. So we will be able uh, to make very good statistical studies of the distribution of exoplanets. The only problem is that this method is difficult uh, to follow up. So it's very difficult to reproduce this effect and uh, therefore is uh, more difficult to characterize the planet. But for example, the Roman telescope that will be launched by NASA in 2024, yeah, 25, it will also use this method to discover a, a large number of exoplanets. Okay, but what are the questions uh, that we still uh, um, want to go much deeper into? Well, what, uh, if we look at what we know about exoplanets today, here uh, I show you uh, our solar system in a diagram uh, which uh, represents the planet mass uh, with respect to the distance to the star. And then, well, here, of course, you see the planets that we all know. Uh, you see uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then uh, the giant and the ice planets. If we uh, overlap the exoplanets that we know for which we have information on the, on the mass, then we get this picture. And then, uh, well, as we've already uh, said before, we have or the order of uh, 4,400 uh, confirmed exoplanets and very similar number of candidate exoplanets that we haven't been able to confirm yet. But if you look at this picture, you see that actually the area where uh, the planets of our solar system are is rather empty. It means that the observations that we have done until now, which are fantastic, and then they have given us a lot of information, they're still not enough uh, to uh, help us understand 
uh, the context of our solar system and how different our similarities to other uh, planetary systems. Therefore, yeah, still, there are many open questions. What are planets made of? Uh, we have a lot of uncertainties of the composition of the exoplanets. We get ideas of their bulk composition, but still there are large error bars and there are also uh, a lot of variety of different types of exoplanets and therefore we need to understand much better the, what, yeah, what their composition is. How do planets form and evolve? I mean, we still, we are learning every day, we get in clues every day, but there are many open questions of how they form and how they get to uh, the state what they are now. What are the architectures of planetary systems? I show you, for example, this special architecture of, uh, of, of the Cheops discovery. And then in this particular case, we still don't understand why the density distribution of the planets is like this. And then every single system gives us a clue or a mystery of, uh, or an additional mystery of how things are as they are. What is the composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets? We are just getting the first glimpses of the of the yeah the composition the chemical abundances of the atmosphere and we have to go much farther are there moons orbiting exoplanets everybody is looking for moons around exoplanets i mean it would be great i mean there have been some uh, uh, yeah uh, publications but still uh, there's a, a lot of uh, doubts there are the, a lot of discussions about if these uh, few discoveries that have been published are real or not is our solar system unique? I already showed you that we still need much more observations to understand the context. What makes a planet habitable? Uh, this is the, one of the bigger questions. I mean, what it really makes, uh, how do we know that a planet is habitable? And then of course, I mean, the, one of the bigger uh, and most fundamental questions that we have, are there other planets similar to Earth? Well, the question is that we need more exoplanets around bright star to answer these questions. And why is, uh, why is this uh, a problem? I mean, actually, uh, I wanted to represent here what the status is now of the distribution of the number of exoplanets according to the uh, brightness of the star. So the, uh, well, when you look at the x-axis uh, on the left, these are the brightest stars and faintest stars are at the, at the right. So then in this particular case, then uh, uh, you see that uh, the planets for which we have, we know the radius uh, are represented in, uh, in blue. And then it's indeed a large number of exoplanets. We know a lot, uh, uh, most of the exoplanets we know about are their, we know about their radius. Uh, for those planets for which we know the mass, then you can see here, uh, they are represented in, uh, in brown. And then it's much less because these are normally exoplanets that are discovered with radial velocities and actually we were to obtain radial velocities, as we say, we need a large number of photons and this can only be done when we uh, have bright stars. Therefore, we need more exoplanets around bright stars that we can uh, determine their masses. Indeed, the orange or red uh, uh, fringe uh, indicates what is the radius, uh, well, indicates the planets for which we have radius and mass. And this is really much smaller. And then finally, when we go to exoplanets that are uh, small, could be terrestrial, like uh, up to two Earth radii, then we have only the red, uh, sorry, the green fringe here. And this is very, very small. So it means that in spite of the large number of exoplanets that we know, there's only a small number of them for which we know the radius and the mass. And if we want to understand what these planets are made for, this is the first step. So that's why we, if we go uh, uh, to observe brighter stars and we find more exoplanets, it will give us the information that we need. And all, not only for the radius and mass, but also for the atmospheres, because to determine the composition of the atmospheres, we need indeed more photons. Another concept that is also very important is the habitable zone. The habitable zone uh, is defined as this region around the star in which water can exist in liquid form on the surface of the planet. And then it means that indeed, if the exoplanet or the planet is closer to the star, then uh, we get uh, the water evaporized, then it is farther uh, from the star, then we have ice. 
And then it's only one area where uh, this can happen. And then this is what is called the habitable zone, where the uh, water can be in liquid form. Uh, if the star is colder than the sun, so then the habitable zone will be closer to the star. And uh, the other way around, if it's a star that is hotter than the sun, the habitable zone will also be farther. If we look at the number of uh, exoplanets in the habitable zone, uh, for which uh, yeah, uh, we have some information, then uh, we see that this is of the order of uh, yeah, 24 uh, that are a small uh, or could be terrestrial, uh, like uh, with less than two Earth radii. But the problem is that of these exoplanets, uh, most, uh, most of them are indeed exoplanets for which we don't have the, their mass, or they are exoplanets which are, which are uh, around the stars that are colder than the sun. So then they are the red dwarfs. And in this particular case, then the environment is different from the, our solar system. So it means that up to now, we don't have uh, any information, we don't know any exoplanet that with radius and mass that is in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. And okay, and that's why we want indeed to go uh, to have future missions to solve this problem. And then, uh, well, okay, Carlos has already told you about indeed Coro, Kepler. We have indeed uh, the Hubble and Spitzer that have given us very good information or the first information of the composition of the atmospheres. We have, of course, the invaluable contribution of the ground-based observatories. Without them, we cannot do exoplanet science. So then it's always a collaboration on the ground and on, in space. And then here we have indeed Theos and, Ke Ke Tess and Keops, they are both missions that are looking at bright stars for the reason that I uh, told you before. And then the future, the near future of missions that are already approved will bring us the Webb Space Telescope, will bring us PLATO, will bring us Ariel and also uh, further observatories on the ground. Just going uh, very quickly through these uh, yeah, fantastic, uh, wonderful observatories that we will see very soon. And uh, then one is the James Webb Space Telescope. And then in this uh, case here, uh, well, you see indeed still the telescope uh, being prepared already, uh, very soon to go uh, uh, to, the, to the launch pad. Uh, the idea is to launch it in October of this year. So, well, maybe you have already heard a lot about uh, this telescope, but indeed it's an observatory uh, for all topics in astronomy. It's a general purpose observatory. It will go uh, from uh, the early stars uh, to the uh, objects in our solar system through stars and formation of uh, galaxies, etc. But it will make a huge contribution at atmospheres of exoplanets. Indeed, it will, it will look at uh, transits and eclipses of uh, exoplanets in different colors. And then with these observations, it will be able to derive the composition of the atmosphere. In addition, it will also use coronograph techniques like the one I show you in imaging in order to block the star uh, light and then look at the exoplanets around. Uh, the mirror is the biggest mirror ever built uh, and uh, going to space. And it's 6.5 meters here is indeed folded. And then in the next uh, picture, here you see how it's deployed. It has uh, 18 segments. And uh, well, uh, you see also the people that are around in the clean room and uh, the, well, the size of the observatory is really, really impressive. And then it will uh, bring us, uh, uh, well, uh, unbelievable discoveries, I think almost uh, in astronomy in all areas. Then I go to the other mission, to the next mission on exoplanets that the European Space Agency is uh, building now, which is PLATO. And then, uh, well, PLATO indeed will focus on this uh, area where we know very little. Indeed, it will discover new exoplanets that are, that are orbiting up to the habitable zone of black sun-like stars. So it will do the combination of habitable zone and sun-like stars. And then it will be so precise that we will be able to determine uh, the radius, the mass, and the age with unprecedented knowledge. Uh, launch is expected to be in uh, 2026, 27 maybe in the end, we'll, uh, because we're still uh, having a review this, this year. And uh, as uh, you can see here, it will not uh, consist only of one telescope. Actually, it has 26 cameras. 24 of them are uh, partly overlapping in, uh, on the sky. And uh, in this way, 
we can achieve a large field of view because we, we need to observe many stars to discover new exoplanets because the probability of transit is not so high. And, uh, and then also we will have indeed the sensitivity needed to uh, determine the parameters as, uh, as we need in order to uh, determine the composition. And then I will also highlight the question of the age because Plato will be able to do asteroseismology, which is indeed uh, uh, the analysis of the oscillations of the star. And this will tell us much more about the stellar evolution and determine the ages of the stars and therefore of the planet, which is very difficult in uh, the, the life of the star, like uh, what the sun is now in the main sequence. Well, since I'm working for Plato, I'm just uh, not so advanced as uh, Carlos in the developing of uh, the mission. We are. Uh, we have still uh, well uh, a lot in the in the paper phase. Now, but uh, all the requirements, the design, uh, the plans are being done. But now we start building hardware also, and then it's indeed a fantastic feeling to see one of the twenty six cameras that uh, is being now integrated, and then this is the structural model of the camera, and uh, what you can see here is the, the chamber at Estec where it's going to be tested for thermal vacuum uh, uh, conditions. And then uh, I must say that the, I really admire the engineers and uh, there are well tens and hundreds, I would say, of people involved in this development and uh, how in spite of the conditions that we have seen in the COVID pandemic, they really continued working and then they managed to uh, build the camera and uh, deliver it to Estec for this test. So it's really a fantastic achievement. Uh, well, the next observatory that I would uh, also want to highlight is Ariel, and Ariel uh, will uh, study atmospheric uh, composition of atmospheres. Uh, it will be different to JWST in the sense that it's a uh, little bit, well, it's less sensitive, so then the, and also the resolution of the spectra will be smaller, but on the other hand, it will look at more objects. So they will make a large census of the composition of the atmospheres of Jupiter's, of Neptune's, and possibly also super Earth's. And then this will uh, facilitate us to understand much better what is the connection between the composition of the atmospheres and also uh, the composition of the disk where the planets form, uh, which will give us a lot of information on these processes. And then just to finish, I wanted to show you, uh, this is an artistic impression. This is still not there yet, uh, it's being built. And this is the extremely large telescope that the European Southern Observatory is building in Chile. And uh, this is going to be the biggest uh, observatory uh, ever built. The mirror, the main mirror will have 39 meters diameter. So indeed it's going to be huge. Uh, well, you see also the cars, the small cars here, we, uh, and uh, when the, the, it's finished, the dome uh, will be finished around 2025, and also the integration of the mirror will be, there, will be done then, and uh, the first technical light is expected uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be obtained uh, around that year. So then it's not so far away, and uh, we're really all looking forward. Uh, to see indeed uh, the fantastic discoveries, because of course this fantastic telescope will also be combined with uh, uh, great instruments that uh, will be able uh, to see uh, uh, well the atmospheres of exoplanets in a lot of detail. And then we expect that indeed it is possible that actually with JWST and the ELT, we will be able to see maybe the uh, biomarkers, it could be in an exoplanet around one of these red dwarfs that I mentioned before. So exoplanets that are uh, in the habitable zone of uh, uh, stars that are smaller than the sun. So then this could be for the Earth-like exoplanets to determine their atmospheres, we still need more ambitious projects, but this will come in the, in the next decade. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, then I hope that, uh, well, I, I have given you a glimpse of the uh, huge, uh, fantastic, uh, interesting discoveries that we are having in the area of exoplanets. And then also, I hope that, uh, yeah, uh, you are also uh, waiting uh, to see the, the results of these exciting new, these new observatories. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
topic to study because you know this is essentially the search of extraterrestrial life, right? Well, uh, this uh, well, there are many questions that are important, but of course, uh, the the question that we share, uh, I think that uh, well, in the history of humankind and also uh, for uh, for everybody that uh, that they li likes. Uh, to understand what is our place in the cosmos uh, in general is also, of course, the search for extraterrestrial life. So then it's, uh, um, let's put it this way, if, uh, we don't know if we will discover extraterrestrial life mm. with these observatories. I mean, every piece of information that we get um, helps us understanding uh, much better how our, our solar system formed, how Earth came to be. So then every piece of information uh, helps us understand our origins. But of course, I mean, the ultimate question is that, yeah, is there life uh, somewhere else? And then this, uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, uh, it depends who you talk to. Some people expect uh, to have this information soon with some biomarkers. Other mm. people claim that in spite of having uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, detection of uh, chemical uh, uh, yeah, components or molecules that could indicate life, the discussion will go for a long time. Like that's, for example, in Mars or uh, mm. yeah, that is not so easy to yeah to conclude that there's life somewhere but who knows i mean uh, there are uh, well I, I just just to finish with the, with the answer i mean there are also for example proposals not only to look at the molecules that uh, would be associated with the fact that there's life in a planet on a planet but also for example with uh, um, molecules or uh, uh, yeah or atoms or sort of uh, yeah a complex uh, 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 complex structures that would mm. indicate that these are civilized uh, yeah, uh, groups of uh, yeah, beings that are uh, building structures, they have pollution, for example, mm -hmm. could we detect their pollution, could we detect uh, their machines built around uh, their uh, planets or their stars. So then, uh, yeah, not only to detect this, but maybe also to detect the in intelligent life in this other way, yeah. Now, um, obvi obviously, we cannot expect to have achieved, you know, such a um, uh, technical prowess in order to, um, you know, detect the steampunk society somewhere out there. But so we will be uh, for the nearby future detect only, you know, molecules, essentially, as you uh, as you said, uh, what types of molecules are we talking about? I mean, what are, what are, what are the signatures that we are actually uh, looking for here? Yeah, there are uh, different uh, molecules, but uh, well, the ones that uh, if we had all together, all of them together in a spectrum, for example, we would if we have uh, water vapor, mm -hmm. clearly, I mean, this is an indication that there's life, like we, as we know it, eh, because every time that we are talking about life, uh, it has to be in the context of the life on Earth uh, that is mm -hmm. based on carbon, of course, and then, but it could be other ways of life that we don't know. If it's I was going to say, isn't that too anthropocentric? Uh, not anthropocentric. How how would you call that? T terra centric. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. biology. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of. But okay, if we think that's a trace, water vapor, of course, oxygen, mm. also, uh, also methane will be very interesting. CO two. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, th th this type of molecules, but not only. Uh, that they are present, but they are present with certain uh, balances, with certain composition, with certain uh, abundances mm -hmm. that are in non-equilibrium because mm -hmm. uh, some of these molecules can also be generated by other process. And then right. uh, yeah, we see, we see them uh, sometimes, yeah, we see ozone or we see oxygen or we see water, but this doesn't mean that there's life only if the proportion of the different amounts is in such a, is, is presented in such a way that indicates that there's a non-equilibrium and this non-equilibrium normally is the presence of life. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, Carlos, from, uh, from the point of view of the broad public, do you think that uh, such evidence, like, okay, we have found a chemical composition in specific proportions that will suggest a probability of life. Do you think that that would be sufficient to, you know, for, for the general public or even for the scientific community to just say, okay, we are not alone? Yeah, it could be, of course. Yeah, I think it, uh, of course, it will depend on, on the evidence and, and we know how science uh, advances uh, to, uh, you know, questioning all the, all the findings, all the theories that explain what, what we see sure. and, and it could happen uh, although for sure it would also I'm sure uh, require strong evidence uh, because uh, we see it every time that a new discovery announced uh, for instance related to, uh, mm. to a potential life uh, previous life on Mars or, or, 
or on a comet, etc. At the same time, there are also other uh, people looking for potential explanations. We have seen the very recent example of uh, Oumuamua, uh, the yeah. uh, interstellar um, comet that was detected and whose characteristics could not be uh, well explained uh, by the current models. And therefore, yeah. some people were proposing a potential um, you know, uh, origin as a... Um, uh, from a different civilization. And then at the same time, there were also other scientists proposing theories uh, that could explain it uh, just as a natural uh, comet. So uh, most likely this discussion uh, will take long and uh, it may take a while until uh, in a way there is agreement in the science community. Yeah. Uh, we have discovered evidence uh, that in a way we are not alone in terms of uh, life forms. Yeah. Other, other planets. Yeah. yeah, I would imagine that it's actually going to be the scientists who will be pushing the brakes because uh, we know how media reacts. I remember uh, when recently they discovered, now I, I cannot remember the exact chemical that was discovered on Venus, but uh, I'm sure you guys probably know what I'm talking about. But I was in the, uh, in the car with my son listening to the radio, and when they, uh, when they you know, gave this news, I turned to my son and I said, son, this is probably the most important moment in human history. So listen carefully, you know, this might be something to remember. Uh, so it's, it, it was just like, a, you know, jumping, jumping to conclusions. So we really have to be, have to be careful uh, here with, with, your, with your results and how they're communicated to the, to the broad public, right? Uh, okay, so, um, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, do uh, in order to acquire these extraordinary evidence, I mean, what is? Um, do you think that there there should be some sort of uh, like an engineering or uh, a fundamental science leap that is required in order to be able to collect you know the sufficient type of evidence, or um, currently the state of science and the state of technology will allow us with time to um, to collect sufficient evidence of that. Yeah, if I may, Anna, on the engineering uh, side, there was, um, with respect to exoplanet, uh, already long ago, more than, yeah, maybe 20 years ago, there were a number of missions that were proposed uh, to um, truly yeah, take a big um, leap in our um, uh, understanding of exoplanets via interferometry, uh, you know, uh, via telescopes uh, operating in, in information flying, so that they could uh, even, you know, directly detect uh, those exoplanets. And there were uh, missions proposed both uh, at the ESA and, and by NASA, uh, the Darwin mission and the terrestrial planet finder on, on the NASA side. And uh, after some years, we realized on both sides of the Atlantic that we were not yet there in terms of technology that we could not uh, have such a mission uh, because it was simply too far away in terms of, you know, too demanding in terms of technology. So uh, at the same time, this was 20 years ago, and, and we have also, there were other, other discoveries, other methods of uh, detecting exoplanets. And uh, so we cannot predict what will happen, but for sure uh, it's quite a continuous improvement in terms of uh, the technology and the type of uh, uh, signals, the type of observations that we can make. So I'm sure it's going to be, it's going to keep being exciting for yeah. the many years to come. But there, there at the same time, there is the real prospect of you, uh, of, of, of both of you, never witnessing the, the, the result that you're expecting. It's just interesting from a psychological point of view what it feels like to be involved in a program or in a field uh, which uh, will probably deliver the answer of the fundamental question that started it all uh, in hundreds of years. You know, that's, that, that takes some, some very, uh, you know, psychological rigidity, so to say. Mm. You think so, or? <laughs> to me, there is, you know, there is the... It's not only about the final question, and the mm. process is uh, much of exploration. Yeah. And, and to me, this is uh, very rewarding, uh, also at this stage. So it's mm. not that we need to get uh, this final answer, it's just that the question, uh, you know, as a kid, I used to um, to, to read about this Voyager mission and, yeah. and, and, and all the amazing pictures it returned from the moons of the, you know, Jupiter and Saturn and 
mm-hmm. and Neptune. And, 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 and this was, in a way, a truly example of exploration because, uh, you know, we have no clue about how the um, Triton looked like. And, and, and from yeah. one moment on, there was a picture. So that's truly exploration. It's truly, uh, truly uh, getting to know what is the unknown or, or the first pictures from the surface of Titan. Um, and this is now happening. I mean, now the solar system is, is not, uh, of course, uh, there's still uh, lots to, to explore, but, uh, but we now keep exploring by looking at all these planets and planetary systems that were totally unexpected. So uh, to me, the process is very rewarding uh, just, just by knowing. And, and there's so many stars and so many planets. <laughs> And the variety of, of, of uh, sort of types of plants is so, I mean, it's truly a uh, yeah. I To me, uh, it, it fully satisfies, if you want, <laughs> my curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, seeing, seeing, seeing uh, a, a new world. Uh, even through a you know spectrograph or you know by, by its chemi- chemical composition, that's uh, that's also that's also probably something you know, it, and it and it probably feels feels great because there are some weird planets out there. Uh, but uh, Anna, you wanted to to say something about that as well. Well, for me, every step is uh, fun- is great. I mean, every yeah. step is a satisfaction to, and, uh, and then well, science is like this. Eh? We go step by step, and mm. uh, we small steps. Uh, uh, then uh, we, are, we increase our knowledge. And of course, uh, now and then there are big uh, leaps, no? like uh, for example, indeed, uh, yeah, like Einstein with uh, relativity, the, relativity theory. But on the other hand, yeah, everything that, uh, that we do on small scales and uh, every step uh, builds and then uh, yeah. it contributes. And then, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so to me, uh, it's, it's a continuous discovery. This is what it makes it uh, amazing. No? The continuous discovery. Every day we are discovering something new, and then of course, I mean, to what extent we are going to get answers to our fundamental questions, we don't know. Mm. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't find it um, uh, frustrating. Or uh, mm. the, you know, on the other hand, I mean, uh, is uh, is I, I mean, I think like, like it's also something because it's the effort of so so many people. Eh? I mean, yes. I think that's the public doesn't have the visibility of the hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people that are involved in uh, these missions, in uh, all the discoveries, in uh, yeah, building these, uh, these uh, mirrors, in indeed uh, launching satellites. And then uh, it's something we do all together. And mm. uh, I think that from this point of view is uh, yeah, quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I just think that uh, it's still prevalent to, to a certain extent um, you know the image of the lone scientist who makes makes a huge discovery, and right now we're at the stage of development of science where it's a, it's a humongous effort, you know, and and building building the shoulders that next generations will step on, I think, is is plenty <laughs> for a lifetime, you know. So uh, yeah, science is incremental uh, and you know and and, and slow. Uh, but still, uh, you know, people need to understand that because uh, we still we still get questions like like that. It's like, really, you're studying this fly for what reason exactly? You know, or really, you're looking at this uh, tiny, uh, completely dark, barely visible planet, hundreds of light years away. Why? You know, this is why. You know, because little by little, you uh, you know, as we say in Bulgaria, drop by drop, you create a stream. So that that definitely makes sense. Uh, all right. So now uh, you both are part uh, of this whole effort to study exoplanets. I'm gonna ask probably a, a fifth grade question here, so I apologize for that. But do you guys have like a favorite planet that uh, that you would like to explore personally? Yeah. Well, it's, uh... per- not personally, collectively, but you're just specifically interested in this specific exoplanet, and for what reason? Yeah. Actually, I think that uh, well. For I think well, I, all exoplanets are interesting for one is reason or the other. Mm. But actually, uh, the the, planet, the exoplanets that are very interesting are the ones closer to our closest star. Mm. And then, of course, we have Proxima B, and uh, Proxima B was uh, indeed uh, an exoplanet that was discovered around the uh, yeah the, the smaller star that is in uh, in the Alpha Centauri system. And then the problem of this star is uh, this exoplanet is that we haven't seen transits yet. So then we have seen it in radial velocities. 
but we haven't seen the transit. And then, uh, well, uh, to me, everything that uh, we discover in, um, in our closer, closer environment or closer stars is uh, fascinating because yeah, first we can explore, explore it much better, like uh, also the, the exoplanets we talked about, uh, about before. Uh, and, and also even in, uh, yeah, in the future, one can even think of going there. No? There are all these initiatives of travel to Alpha, Cent the Alpha Centauri system and see if there are planets there and then, uh, yeah, and to bring information because uh, yeah, with, with the special engineering, people think that we could start thinking not uh, with humans, not with human uh, space flight, mm -hmm. but uh, with robots. Uh, it would be possible maybe to, to send robots to these systems. So then it's a combination of the, yeah, of the interest of, of the exoplanet as such and the possibility of going even farther no, in its uh, uh, exploration. And Carlos, what is yours? <laughs> On my side, uh, my background is um, as an engineer is on, on trajectories and, and celestial mechanics. So I'm very much interested in the, in the dynamics of, of the orbits and, and, and how the, the planets orbit the, the, the host stars. And in particular, I, I find um, uh, very fascinating those uh, planets that may be orbiting uh, binary stars uh, and they may have on their skies uh, two suns, or, or even more than that. And, and there's a bunch of them that have already been discovered, and and is also one another area where you know you can make your predictions. That actually, <laughs> what we have found already, uh, it goes beyond what we had imagined. So there's a lot of uh, yeah, there's a lot of surprises there, and 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 I found those systems uh, truly beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. And of course, uh, we may never go there, but uh, just to imagine that it exists. And uh, you know, now we have, uh, we can do wonderful move with movies and, <laughs> and yeah. feel like we are there. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dual star systems. I mean, you, you're a sci fi fan. I mean, you have to admit it. <laughs> that's, that's right. Probably, you probably like it. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, and now you did mention that you're uh, interested in their orbital, orbital dynamics and, uh, and et cetera. So, are there any exoplanets that currently sort of defy our understanding of how planets are, are formed? I mean, any real oddities out there that are breaking, I don't know, Kepler's lower, for example, or something like that? No, from the dynamical point of view, not, but from the density's point of view, uh, yes, yeah, I mean... Uh, so uh, then, I'm sorry, uh, from density? The density, yeah, like like uh, one I explained before, no. So the the TOI one seven, the, the one that the Keops discovered, for example, this is uh, a typical one that indeed uh, we don't understand. Uh, yeah, why the distribution of exoplanets is like this? Because at the same time, the, the exoplanets are in resonance uh, because probably there was there were very few perturbations. Uh, when the planets form, but at the same time, the distribution of densities don't correspond to an environment where there were not these perturbations. So then it's not well understood with our current uh, theories. But on the other hand, um, when we look also at all the super Earths, for example, that are close uh, to the to the star. I mean, the, with the uh, Jupiters, then there's uh, all the theory of formation of migration from outside to the inside and getting closer to the star. Uh, the super Earth, uh, there's still, um, yeah, in many cases, it's difficult to understand if the super Earth was really uh, formed by being migrated, migrated from uh, external part of the system or actually was formed in situ. So then the, there are still a lot, a lot of questions of how these, uh, how these super Earths form. And uh, yeah, and, and there are there are yeah a lot. What well, we mm. we don't know yet. That's why we need to observe many more systems because sometimes we have uh, examples of each anomaly, uh, only one system of only one planet. And then in order to understand much better, uh, yeah, well, why this happens, we need to observe many more. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there are many processes like uh, all the issue of migration, indeed of. Uh, yeah, how exactly you can get to certain uh, amounts of densities of exoplanets and uh, bulk compositions. And, and of course, and if you look also at the atmospheres, I mean, uh, they were still making, now we start making the connection of indeed the composition of the atmospheres of these Jupiters that are so close to the star to the composition of the disk uh, in, the, in the initial uh, phases of when, uh, when the planet was formed. And uh, this is still not uh, obvious at all. I mean, uh, we still need to learn a lot there. 
so to make this link between uh, when we observe a disk, uh, when the planets are being formed, and when we see the planets afterwards, what happened in between. Mm -hmm. Carlos, what about you? Uh, can you can you think of something or? Uh, not in terms of the dynamics, indeed, uh, I think it's quite remarkable how powerful you know, our equations are, right? Yeah. Because, uh, uh, we were used to test them uh, for our solar system, mm -hmm. derive them from what we knew and test them with the solar system, and, and we realized they were good and they were able to explain, you know, not only the orbit of the planets, but also of the asteroids and the comets and the Trojans at the Earth cloud, etc. And now we see that they can also explain, you know, how those planetary systems are behaving in stars that are many light years away from, from us. So, which is, if you think about it, theoretically, is so powerful. Uh, yeah. and, and, and of course, uh, we all only see those uh, planetary systems at any given moment in their history, right? So we can propagate backwards and try to imagine how the system looked like uh, millions of years ago and also what would be the evolution, but we cannot be sure about that. And yeah. because even if our equations are, are extremely good, then you know, the uncertainty propagates um, backwards and forwards. So, of course, very interesting uh, topic to be able to see also, you know, those equations in action in conditions that may be different to those that we knew from the solar system. Right, so are you, are you saying that we currently can only test them within the context of, of, of our own solar system. Did I get you? Did I get you right that we don't have sufficient evidence or observational capabilities to confirm them with? No, no, no. What I was saying is that uh, uh, up to now, uh, you know, we could only test them uh, right. yes. in exoplanets. But now that we know exoplanets, we see that they can They're, explain what we see around other stars. Yeah, the equations are sound. It doesn't matter what we do with them and in what conditions we put them in. They're sound. Okay, that's 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 good. You know, <laughs> because you know if <laughs> it no, brings... also science, uh, we you know I'm sure that uh, if there's anything that uh, doesn't fit, huh, uh, we will flag it. Uh, but so far, it has not happened. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know because I think that uh, you know a, a scientific revolution in the in the physical laws, uh, although it's necessary and probably inevitable at some point, it sort of feels unnerving to me. You know, it's like suddenly if you realize that okay, Einstein was wrong now, like uh, for for example, you know. So, so for now, good news. Uh, now, uh, I uh, I wanted to ask about the. Uh, again, you know, going back to the perception of the of the general public. Now, most of the media that we see out there related to exoplanets, uh, you know, even from from like popular science science journals, uh, they describe planets in a very vivid in very vivid ways. Meaning that you you read, for example, about I don't know Kepler seventy eight uh, or some other planet, and it's and what we get there is a description of the atmosphere. You know, it's probably you know very huge, and there are huge storms out there, and it's uh, you know, and you have. We have fairly detailed explanations of what the surface is, or, or you know, might be, uh, what the atmosphere is, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, how, how much of these, uh, of this information, is actually um, uh, an extrapolation of uh, a very, of, of, of a more simplistic data? I guess what I'm trying to say is that should we be careful when we when we read articles like that about about planets? And shall we assume that it's uh, that it's probably an exaggeration, or or we should be fairly trustful? And of course, I'm not talking about you know some tabloid here. I'm you know, Scientific American, you know, Popular Science magazine, and etc. Well, I don't I don't think that uh, that there are exaggerations. Um, I think that sometimes, of course, uh, when we read, uh, yeah, it's an Earth-like planet. I mm. mean, this we, we read a lot. And then this is the only expression, actually, the community uh, yeah, of exoplanet scientists is discussing this also, because uh, yeah, this is used very often in publications, uh, in, in the media, and so on. this is an Earth-like planet. But uh, what it means, but Earth-like planet is that it has a, a composition that is probably silicates, no? At least I think, I think that we can say that indeed is, uh, it has a rocky composition, this mm -hmm. we can say. But what we cannot say is that this Earth-like in the sense of having the same atmosphere, having a biosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And uh, so then that's why this expression is something that we have to be careful with. Mm. So it's, it would be better, for example, to say Earth-sized planet 
or, uh, or similar to, uh, yeah, to the earth composition, I don't know, something. But it's, it's just a question that uh, is true that if you say so many times that you discover an Earth-like planet, and then at the moment that you really discover one that is indeed at a similar distance from a sun-like star, uh, which uh, indeed has a similar bulk composition and in the atmosphere, we can characterize the same type of gases. Um, then, uh, yeah, then uh, it will be <laughs> a little bit of pity that uh, for so long we have been saying that uh, there are others that are Earth-like. I think that this is the only point that I would, uh, yeah, consider with care. Uh, but for the rest, when people uh, say, yeah, they, they only, okay, sometimes the, ambigu the ambiguities or the, um, if there are degeneracies in the data, they are not mentioned. Eh? So sometimes there are two or three solutions and, uh, to, the to the possible composition. And then uh, the, only the one who has uh, higher chances to, to be uh, true is the one that is given. But sometimes there are degeneracies in the way that we interpret the data that, yeah, it could be slightly different. Eh? So especially when we talk about the internal composition and so on. But on the other hand, so it's more a question of indeed not so much exaggeration, but using terms that may be too general, like Earth-like, or indeed not mentioning uh, yeah, all the uncertainties, let's put it this way, not mentioning the uncertainties. But for the rest, I think that uh, when we read uh, yeah, the uh, public articles that are written in, the, in general magazines of uh, interest for scientists or for the public that like science, I think that is, uh, they, they are quite okay in general, yes. Right. Uh, okay, now, <laughs> it's it, it's weird, but I mean, how would you, uh, I wanna go with some French, French science here, but um, let's just say that um, you have to, um, to pick one major revolution in, uh, in scientific thinking or again in, in, in engineering, uh, which, which one of the you know speculative ones, let's say you know AI, uh, you know nanotechnology or whatever, which one do you, which of these fields of uh, future scientific uh, uh, development do you think will have the most and biggest impact on our ability to actually detect, find, and 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 research um, exoplanet? You know, is it is it a revolution in optics or in energy? In uh, in, in in what? Carlos? Yeah, uh, from yeah, what, what you have said, I would say is, um, yeah, I don't think uh, from the point of view of the, um, I would say basic spacecraft engineering, uh, it would be um, that revolutionary. Uh, so for instance, it's not related to, you know, when we talk about visiting uh, other parts of the solar system, Propulsion technologies uh, play a key role. I mean, if we want to go uh, to Mars often, we need to shorten the the time of travel, right? And and you have to be uh, have more efficient uh, uh, propulsion, or you have to be ready to support uh, radiation. And uh, you know, radiation shielding becomes important if you want to go to G Jupiter and operate mm -hmm. there. Uh, here we are talking, I mean, essentially we go to space uh, to get rid of the atmosphere, right? So sure. uh, we don't need to go much farther away than, for instance, uh, where uh, James Webb is in, in L2. And I think there's a lot of science that we could still do from L2. So we don't need a revolution from that point of view. However, clearly for the instruments, it's a question of uh, size, it's a question of uh, resolution, it's a question of the power data that you can download. Uh, with uh, James Webb, uh, we are truly pushing the boundaries of where we can fit within a launcher. And we have this uh, very uh, complex um, deployment. Uh, but there, I'm sure uh, we will see more projects like this, uh, you know, being bigger uh, structures that you can actually build in space, right? Uh, so you may launch in smaller parts and then assemble in space, or uh, this formation flying that we can, uh, that we were discussing before, or uh, extremely long uh, structures uh, with deployables. Uh, so in this aspect of engineering, uh, you know, new materials, uh, new um, intelligence, but not in the sort of artificial intelligence, but uh, control algorithms, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. the co control that is used, for instance, 
to achieve a vertical landing for a, uh, for a rocket mm-hmm. is the sort of technology that may control the deployment and uh, uh, you know maintenance of the formation flying uh, with extreme degree of accuracy. So all these revolutions will contribute to, uh, I think, uh, yeah, getting uh, more and more capable instruments on orbit. Uh, propos- propulsion is a is a is a very nice. I a very nice point. I mean, of course, wormholes, you know, let's let's invent that so we can just go ahead and visit those places. You know, that's that's definitely something. Uh, but it's not it's not even closely feasible. Although I just read an article that somebody somebody actually proved that they're pow- that they're uh, you know possible to achieve. I didn't read through because these usually go over my head. Uh, but wormholes, yeah, we, uh, we fingers crossed. Anna, is there something that you're looking forward to in terms of engineering or fundamental science that that, that you think will have a significant impact? Uh, yeah, actually. Um I think, well, I, I might, I'm going to say maybe something controversial now, so mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope that, uh, no, but I think that uh, we are very close to have the technologies necessary to do very big discoveries in the area of exoplanets and so on, but, um, but I, I, it needs a lot of resources. And then, of course, this is, uh, yeah, this is an issue that uh, mm-hmm. is always difficult. But, uh, but if you look at the studies that, uh, that have been carried out at ESA and at, uh, at NASA, of uh, the next generation, uh, the next generation of spacecraft of observatories, uh, then actually we could really deter- we could really even image exoplanets uh, like the Earth if they were around the stars that are closer to the to the sun, of course. And uh, yeah, we could determine the, with a lot of detail the detail of the composition of their atmospheres also. And um, in the end, is uh, are technologies that, of course, they need to be developed, but they are not major uh, breakthroughs of mm-hmm. things that we cannot even imagine. I mean, mm-hmm. it would be, indeed, as we said about before, no incremental, but of course, it needs resources and it needs time. And then this is the problem that, uh, of course, we can follow the path and the uh, and the, the rhythm that society can can afford, basically. Yeah. And then this is something that we have to take into account. So then that's why, yeah, but that, that this is why I mean that actually we could, I mean, uh, with resources, we will be able to do a lot because a lot of our technologies, they are very, very close to, to get these mm-hmm. measurements already. <laughs> and if, of course, if I could dream, then it would be fantastic indeed to, to be able to send uh, robots close to the speed of light, because then indeed uh, we will uh, be able to explore many yeah. systems. And then this, uh, again, I mean, the, as we said before, there are studies already about this. And then, well, if there are uh, warm uh, <laughs> holes and so on, this uh, this is another uh, this is an, another dimension uh, of uh, possibilities. But uh, yeah, but uh, I, I think that we, we are accelerating so much in discoveries of late that is actually quite impressive. But uh, yeah. what we will be able to do very soon. It's funny that the answer to your question was actually, well, we need a revolution in funding of science. <laughs> that's that's what we actually need. You know? Yeah, well, I understand that this is very delicate, and of course, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but but what I mean is that uh, the, the technologies are very close there already. Yeah, to do yeah. That. Well, I mean, considering uh, considering what um, I mean, what what the European Space Agency is doing right now for the cost of correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, was it like a euro per person per year right now or? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I remember some a coffee, a coffee per person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. some some sort of an uh, you know analogy. So, uh, so certainly, you know, ch- changing the uh, you know the individual minds and our collective minds and changing the public's perception about science and what uh, you know institutions such as um, ESA are are doing is is very crucial. So uh, it's very crucial for uh, you know for all of us uh, essentially. So I hope uh, that this is this is us uh, you know giving our little. <laughs> You know, uh, pitch into this uh, into this effort, uh, but I mean, uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, big discoveries are really coming. I think that uh, the best uh, you know way to um, to excite uh, the public around science is by giving it the sexy results, and and these are certainly uh, certainly coming with. Uh, you know, especially following the information that you guys uh, just shared. You know, James Webb. We're waiting for that. Uh, it, it really sounds sounds really exciting. So. Um, I want to thank you for uh, for, the, for this participation uh, tonight. Um, surely, I will be following uh, how uh, you know the Cheops mission is um, 
is developing and, and we'll be looking forward to new uh, images and articles being released about the exoplanets uh, coming in the near future. I would like to, uh, to wish you lots of health and a lot of, uh, lots of professional success. Uh, and thank you on behalf of uh, all of us for uh, doing what you, what, you, what you are doing, you know, because it's a tremendously complex <laughs> you know, for, for lay people like us. Uh, and um, and it's and, and it's very exciting what you what you guys are doing. So thank you thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thanks to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks thanks uh, for also the opportunity to to be here and, and to talk about what we do. I mean, we feel it as a privilege uh, because uh, because we love what we do. Yeah. And and, and uh, but we also like to, to to be able to to communicate it and, and, and to share with the. With a more general audience, uh, because we we do think it's worthy, <laughs> and it's uh, it's very nice uh, nice results that uh, are coming yeah. from all this uh, hard work. <laughs> Well, uh, we will certainly reserve uh, a time slot next year to, uh, you know, to to catch up on, you know, how things are are going. So, um, you know, hopefully you will be um, around to uh, to help us out with another event. So I'm I'm looking I'm looking forward for that. Uh, Anna Carlos, thank you once more for uh, for participating uh, tonight. Uh, you can stick around. I just have a, a few words to share with our audience, uh, and then you know we will we will say a proper a proper goodbye. Um, all right, uh, guys, thank you very much for, uh, for watching this event. Again, it was supported by uh, the European Space Agency, this particular uh, event, uh, also by the National Culture Fund and, uh, and Mellon, of course. Uh, s we would also like to thank, I, I almost forgot that, by the way, um, uh, Sofia Tech Park. Uh, I, I always tend to say that the lights are on thanks to the Patreons. Now, this is 100% correct, but the lights are actually owned by Sofia Tech Park. Uh, so we would like to thank them as well for providing us with this, uh, with the studio and the opportunity to do Ratio online here. Now, uh, what is coming ahead uh, in terms of uh, events? Uh, now, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, it's summer now. Um, it seems like the pandemic is sort of under control. Um, I'm really careful with my wording here, uh, but uh, we will be able to do some open events uh, very, very soon. So uh, for all of you who follow what we do, uh, now, make sure that you check uh, that you check out regularly because we will be doing some open air events uh, very soon. But uh, what is coming uh, really really soon? It's on the twenty seventh of May. That's actually a couple of in a couple of days again at eight o'clock. Uh, it's the new format uh, that we call DNA Danka in Bulgarian discussions about culture and science. We will be doing an event about classical music in the virtual world. Now it's going to be an interesting uh, event for all of you there who are interested in music and the musical business in general and how it's going to change uh, in the near future. So Danka, our future format. Uh, certainly you can, um, you know, um, check out uh, our website and uh, the videos of previous events that we've been doing, and especially the space-related events uh, that we've been uh, making with the support of the European Space Agency. You have like different things. We're talking about Mars, space debris, Mars again. You know, plenty, plenty of things to satisfy uh, your curiosity about our universe. Uh, thanks again to our Patreons. Uh, we will hope that we are hoping that this list will become, um, you know, too big to show very soon. But thank you guys for uh, for continuing your continuous support. If you would like to uh, support us and you haven't done so by now, patreon.com slash ratio BG is the way to go. You can also buy a T-shirt or a book. Uh, or just you know come to our come to our, one of our events. And as uh, it is um, customary now in the internet age, uh, follow us on you know whatever platform that you're using: Facebook, Twitter. Um, you know, watch our YouTube videos, uh, etc. Just follow us, uh, and uh, it is our promise that we will do our best to give you the best of the world uh, of science and and culture. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. I wish you a very wonderful evening. It's still warm outside, so take a walk, walk the dog, go to a bar, enjoy, have fun, be careful, stay healthy, and I will see you next time.